and we are back here on the home front it is rome and thank you for joining us for another exciting episode of home front unplugged and the last time we had a home front episode we had our two frontline doctors senior doctors dr shivani maharaj dr joseph ramdani from sugar wellness and from arima in the the, the health district the district emergency district emergency right so the last time they were here we were discussing some of the home remedies because a lot of the people who contracted COVID-19 didn't carry about enough symptoms for them to be hospitalized. So you all directed them to go home and quarantine. Correct. And some of them at home were trying some home remedies to kind of speed up the recovery process. And the last time we were here, Joseph was telling us about some of the, the effects. And if we, we want to kind of clarify in terms of the I, is it ivermectin? ivermectin? Right, because I've seen some people messaging here. They said it was ivermectin that they were using or they wanted to use. Mm -hmm. And you were telling us the last time in terms of if you recommend its use or not. Right. So current protocols do not recommend um, the routine use of ivermectin. But there are a number of trials and studies that are going on. Last time we would have been speaking about some of the, the steps you take to verify a drug, mm -hmm. make sure mm -hmm. it's safe for human consumption. Um, and we're not at that point. All right, so we're not recommending the ivermectin. I'm seeing another message here coming in. It says, what about oxygen tanks? Right, so oxygen therapy is something certainly that a lot of persons who are at home would benefit from uh, in terms of oxygen support. The problem with oxygen is not the oxygen itself, it's the use of the oxygen. So what happens is that persons who are home and be, are oxygen dependent, if you don't have an oxygen saturation monitor, mm -hmm. just with someone that uh, a lot of persons you see now coming yeah, on yeah, the, the oxygen, oxygen saturation, oxygen. Right. you don't know how much you should use for a certain oxygen level, right? You also have a false sense of security as in I'm getting short of breath, I'm getting short of breath, my, my respiratory is going up, feeling chest tightness, but I have oxygen at home, I'll turn it on. Right. I, I may not have a gauge on you, you may not have a gauge on your oxygen tank, so you're not sure how many liters you use, you're not sure how much that small tank is going to last. So there are a lot of factors that make, while oxygen is important and is, is a cornerstone for persons who are ill, used inappropriately, it could actually cause more harm. So than do good. you recommend that they dabble in the use of oxygen tanks at home if they have one? So oxygen therapy is not new. A lot of patients who have um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease from smoking do have oxygen tanks at home. And at the district emergencies and the COVID tents, we are seeing those who are using oxygen and they are they, they have a more accustomed with using two liters or a small amount. Um, also, you may not know when your oxygen tanks finish, right. so you would be on a mask and not get an oxygen. So it is, it may be recommended in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. but I would say defer to the advice of your uh, treating physician. They may give you some advice and give you some red flag symptoms. Some guidance. Correct. As to so when you would, would go. All right. Out. What I'm seeing here, another message comes in. It says, what about an oxygen concentrator? Right. So that came up, that discussion came up because a lot of, um, I, I certainly would have seen tanks um, you would have heard tanks are running short for the general public, yes. not for the, the hospital um, system. So oxygen concentrators are little machines. Um, there are some portable ones that mm -hmm. um, oxygen in the air is about 21% oxygen and there are 79% nitrogen and maybe a percent or so scattered gases. What an oxygen concentrator does, it actually filters oxygen from the environment. So you could get a higher level concentration of okay. oxygen. So in the absence of a tank and, and persons on low oxygen requirements, certainly is an invaluable adjunct. Mm -hmm. But again, we have to stress caution about the false sense of security with having one of these devices at home and then the, the electricity goes or you're not, it, you're not sure the filter needs to change. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to be very careful using it. And again, with supervision. And what about, I, I know that a lot of, 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 of these things that antibiotics cure everything. Okay. So they're saying here, what about antibiotics? So COVID-19 itself is a virus. And by the very nature of, of being a virus, antibiotics, which are antibacterial, not going to work. However, um, in certain circumstances, for example, um, COVID-19 pneumonia, um, some persons get secondary infections. Even though it's a virus, you get secondary complications. And certainly in the inpatient setting or the mm -hmm. hospital setting, do we, we assess based on the blood test, based on your x-ray findings, based on how your chest exam is, and then we determine um, the use of antibiotics. But it's certainly not something that should be used self-prescribed in the, the ambulatory mm -hmm. or patient setting. So do, do you're not recommending, I had some old antibiotics home from a last illness, right. I could pop some of those antibiotics. No, certainly not. It's certainly not. No. In fact, overuse of antibiotics could cause diarrhea, vomiting by mm -hmm. itself as an overuse and complicate the assessment of COVID-19. So not so, recommended. So, Barney, we're jumping across to you now. I'm seeing here someone is asking about vitamins. What about vitamin D? 
vitamins are very very important right um, vitamin d vitamin c zinc mm -hmm. um i would highly recommend that um you can take daily doses of those keep yourself well hydrated it will help boost the immune system right so, so i would recommend by keeping hydrated it boosts the immune system no keep oh. yourself well hydrated with fluids right and daily supplementation and daily on your vitamin c zinc and d okay yeah they, they say in here um, with the oranges and the fruits right. in terms of the vitamins. So natural vitamins, orange, Portugal's, even things like sweet peppers, they have more than the daily requirement of your vitamins. So boost yourself up on your vitamin C, zinc and D. So is it with the vitamins that is going to help to reduce the effects of the, the virus when you have it? Or are you using the vitamins before you get the COVID-19? Or can you use it both? Well, I would say anybody should be taking those daily requirements of vitamins once we're in this pandemic, because it will actually help boost your immune system. And if you really do contract COVID, your immune system will be better equipped to deal with your COVID infection. Ah. Back, back to you, Joseph. I'm seeing here Tammy flu. Right. So Tammy flu was actually recommended for the viewers who remember back when H1N1 um, was around and Tamiflu is an antiviral agent which was licensed um, specifically for the management of uh, H1N1. No trial to date has shown that it's actually effective in COVID-19. Mm. So you, as an example, you, you, I wouldn't recommend you take an antibiotic to treat a bladder infection and go to manage a meningitis. Right. Yeah, so it's not just because it's an antibiotic or it's an antiviral work. There's no trial currently that suggests a Tamiflu. Tamiflu. I've seen here fever grass and moringa and um, ginger garlic turmeric right. green purple leaves right steaming with eucalyptus oil or peppermint oil wow these people have a lot of remedies yes, so tell so us about some of those by chance soft candle not on that list right it's <laughs> i'm looking for the go go man and the black disinfect and the so sage just now the universal cures so um but certainly um from a, a holistic point of view these medications have not been shown to do any harm so the, there's no evidence that suggests that it actually is curative or modulates the, the response directly, but colloquially, and there have been some anti-inflammatory properties, ginger, turmeric, there have been, in fact, vitamins, as we said, is a key part of this now in terms of modulating and, and giving antioxidant properties. So there are some health benefits associated with these things um, historically, but again, to say that it is curative mm -hmm. or preventative to manage COVID-19, there's, it's not any protocol, but certainly if somebody wants to use it, um, it gives symptomatic control. For example, eucalyptus oil, uh, Vicks vapor rub and vaporizers and so on. There may, certainly may be some element of the congestant effect, you know, some of the heat, steam and so on. And these mm. things could be used for symptomatic control. Well, you have a long time. So, um, as we the older folk, they rub Vicks on your chest yeah, every day. I, I personally uh, could test that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but... It, it is not on a protocol, but certainly there's, there's no harm I, somebody I've seen here paracetamol and ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so paracetamol is panadol, acetaminophen, tanilol. Ibuprofen, commonly what we might know it as Advil, um, Motrin or so. These medications, one, with COVID-19, you can get fever and a lot of body pain. So they actually help to bring down your fever, um, alleviate your body pain, Sometimes you get headache. And with the ibuprofen in particular, it's not only does it bring down fever and take away body pain and aches, it also has some anti-inflammatory properties that actually is a very good drug. Mm -hmm. And I routinely uh, give it to my patients. Because, and you can use it in conjunction with the paracetamol. So yeah, it's not unusual to see someone taking Panadol and ibuprofen together. Ah, yeah. okay. So they could use that safely? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, I'm seeing here positioning and home deep breathing. So which, who, who want to take this one? No, it's fine. So actually in, in so prone positioning and two settings that this happens. So in, in, we spoke about the ventilator and ICU patients. Mm -hmm. um, what they found, the studies have found that if you put patients prone or face oh, down. prone. I thought it was home. No, no, prone. Prone. No. Prone. Okay. prone. Prone is, is. Prone is. You turn around and lie down on your belly. Or you're lying on your belly. Yeah, right. instead of being lying on with your supine, which is on your back. Right. So what they found is that even in ventilated patients, that it actually significantly, um, it gives a higher chance for, for better ventilation based on positioning of the oh. lungs and the airways. Mm -hmm. But certainly at home, you can also um, try prone position and it actually helps with, um, with ventilation and, and oxygenated areas of the lung 
that are that are less dependent on so more you just lie on your stomach and you and breathe you take deep deeply and, and breathing exercises right because I, I did read an article with that in terms of them treating COVID-19 patients in hospitals around the world right. and they try to put the right. patients on their stomach yeah. to help so in a nutshell what it does is most of your lung is to your back so if you're on your abdomen you help expansion and you might be able to open up parts of the lungs that you may not necessarily be able to expand if you're lying on your back so you put them on your belly. All right, all right. So Giovanni, the last time you were here, we were speaking about some of the trends that you were seeing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned to me that you saw a genetic trend. Right, so what we have noticed is um, some families, they have been affected, contracted COVID-19, and you will have mother, father, children requiring hospitalization. So we think that there might be a genetic predisposition. So for example, if someone in your family first degree relative has COVID-19 and requires ICU or mm -hmm. hospitalization. If someone else in that family contracts COVID-19, there's a possibility a of they of requiring them. hospitalization as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we've seen mother, father, children all requiring ICU, hospitalization as some as advanced as ICU care. So we noticed that there's clustering in the severity of illness. Um, on that, Joseph, you was talking earlier about the home oxygen mm -hmm. right what i have noticed in arima maybe in shogunas as well it's difficult to monitor how you're doing and with this wave that we're seeing right now people are rapidly progressing you might be well today mm -hmm. and tomorrow you will be in full-blown erds as a term we use to describe the, the severity of the lung infect illness right so having that home oxygen you cannot monitor and the disease right now is rapidly progressing so, so, so that, that is another trend that that leads me to this question Shivani is that if I am home yes I, I came into the hospital with well I came into the, the health um, facility with COVID-19 my symptoms are mild you send me home to home quarantine how would I know okay this thing getting bad I need to head to the hospital. What, uh, what signs, what symptoms to look out for? Things to look out for. A lot of us now home have their pulse ox. So measure your oxygen level, right? It goes up to 100%. Mm -hmm. Anytime your oxygen level is less than 94%, your, that is a warning sign. You should come to hospital. Secondly, if you're short of breath, if you have chest pain, chest discomfort, if you notice uh, your lips are blue, your is turning blue or generally if you just lip, lip, one time <laughs> generally if you're unwell and you're mm -hmm. not feeling yourself another warning sign if you do have fever and you find your heart racing mm -hmm. or experiencing palpitations come to hospital right okay. now you might be in quarantine but you need to call the ambulance and come to a health facility so so joseph on, on shibani's point in that okay i'm home i i, I get in shortness of breath my heart is, is racing, and my lips are turning blue, and I realize, you know, okay, these are the signs that, that, that Dr. Shivani and, and Dr. Joseph told me that I need to head to the hospital. At home, I call for the ambulance. The ambulance says they're on their way, but it's it taking long because we know the ambulance system is swamped right now, so they wouldn't be there anytime soon. But to me, or, or me watching a family member going down, meaning that it, it looks like it's getting worse, what am I to do then? So... Um, and that is an important point. The, the National Ambulance Service is significantly overwhelmed at this point in time. Um, but they have been responding and they triage person. So if you say somebody's blue, they're not breathing well, you may get a higher priority than somebody else. However, um, we have to accept reality. And if there's some delay in time or they have no available units at that point in time, and you have to get a relative into the, the hospital, then you need to take some precautions. Now, by virtue of you being in the home with the infected person, you may already be what's called a primary contact. Right? And you're supposed to still exercise some sort of barrier and, and sanitization and mask wearing and so on. But if you have to bring a relative who is exhibiting some red flag symptoms, um, you have no other choice, then you should still take precautions. So you should as the, get somebody to bring, bring you. So you would sit on the back of the vehicle, for example. The driver will be in front. No, no additional persons in there. Mm -hmm. Patient wears a mask. The driver wears a mask. You could have some sort of windows down. We don't want central AC and right, ventilation so inside the, the cabin. So you get no external AC. ventilation. Mm -hmm. Um, some persons also try to get some sort of even a clear plastic or something between the driver and the passenger so that to kind of further decrease um, exposure and then you get your relative to the hospital and when you get there you sanitize because we don't allow uh, visitors we want to put visitors in a red zone so mm -hmm. therefore what we would do is that we would ask you to sanitize get rid of your mask and so on dispose appropriately 
and then you could then get an update from, from the facilities which we have been trying to do via the phone to update um, regarding relatives' progress and what's the plan for them. Because if they're that unwell, chances are they might need hospital admission. Right, yeah? right. Okay, and how, I, I wanna ask Giovanni this first. How were you personally affected by this entire pandemic? Hmm. Have you had any specific experience throughout this whole ordeal? Yeah, um, generally, personally, we have sleepless nights. I have had sleepless nights. Um, you worry. And being a physician, in particular being an emergency physician, we dare to save lives. And what I have realized is that it will, it's not everyone you will be able to save. Mm -hmm. And one week ago, it was quite striking. I... Um, we had a family and the children, they lost both parents to COVID-19. Their mother, their father passed a week prior and their mom passed and we had to break wow. those news. So we seen children being orphaned. We see people losing mother and father, close relatives. So the reality of this COVID is a real thing. And we have to, be cautious, exercise or get vaccinated and hope that we see this pandemic come to an end at some point. But it takes us back to getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. That is the only kind of hope right now we have. So how, how was that for you? Were you there? Were you the one who had to, to deliver the call? How did you feel when you saw that children lost the both parents. Room, that was hard. That was very, very hard. Um, I think that was my lowest point within this pandemic. And I have worked constantly since the beginning of this pandemic in emergency with no leave. And that experience was my lowest point. Mm. And emotionally, it was very, very hard. I could, I could hear it in your voice. I could see it, was it hard. on your face. That, that, that would have been A matter of fact, I had to call JP mm -hmm. to give me a pep talk. <laughs> it was so bad. Yeah. So again, reiterating, we need you to get vaccinated so that we don't have to go through these things where you're seeing kids being orphaned up. Um, Joseph, let me ask you the same question. Have you, ever, have you had any experience, specific experience throughout this entire ordeal? So, um, Room, you see these bags below my eyes? Mm. You could go messy with them. <laughs> <laughs> Without, well, you don't have to buy a bag. So, mm. um, the, a lot of sleepless nights. It's a lot of sleepless nights. I've had days where I've slept two hours in two days just because of the, the exigencies of the service, particularly a couple of weeks ago when we were at our heaviest mm -hmm. um, in terms of ill patients and arrangements between inter-hospital transfers. We have facilities that are trying to get admissions. You have um, sick patients decompensating, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, fatigue. So um, I drink personally a lot of coffee to manage. <laughs> I, does, I, I drink a lot of coffee, something like four or five cups a day, just wow. to keep you going through the day and into the night. And the next morning, you get two hours sleep, you get up, and then we just back at it again. And this has been going on since um, last year with a little respite towards the earlier part of the year, and then mm. we started back again. Um, the experience, however, is, and then the, the point I wanted to bring it is, death and dying is nothing new. Patients are still dying from heart, heart disease, from, from pneumonias, from mm -hmm. sepsis, from, uh, you know, my, a lot of the normal things that people die from, they have been dying. But when you throw the disease burden now with COVID and the investment you put in the patients at the facilities, you become part of that process because you're talking to the relatives, mm -hmm. right? You're talking to the patients, you see in the clinical decline for those of us in hospitals, for those of us in district facilities. So it does, to echo what Shivani says, it takes a significant emotional burden on us. So it's that from before, mm -hmm. and it's new that's now. And it's not a good, it's not a psychological that, that, I don't think I could deal with that. You all are definitely strong individuals. All the doctors yeah. on the front line to be able to deal with it's, that on a daily it's basis. It's affecting all members of staff from the, the patient escorts who push them around, the nurses who tied it on, the patient assistants, the clerical persons who register. It's a, it's a burden on a health sector system that mm -hmm. I'm proud to say that I'm part of, especially at this point in time, 
we would have been able to rise to the occasion with every single person in that healthcare team being part of that chain of survival. And we, we are proud of you all and we are again we want to extend our heartfelt thanks to all of the healthcare workers that have been on the front line. Um, one question that we got here from one of our viewers the very very I, I, I love this question it's the person says what would you say is your main sword in in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic meaning you have and they're giving you options it said you have public health measures as one you have vaccinations as two and then you have more staff and more equipment and beds as choice three so basically they're asking you have three choices to fight COVID-19 what is your main choice what would you go with vaccination public health measures or more staff and more equipment in the hospital well we know how the virus is spread right and i think the public health measures are important wear your mask and sanitize wash your hands social distance mm -hmm. but what trumps that get your vaccine that is the only hope to bring back any sort of normalcy get vaccinated so you're going with the vaccine if you had one to choose you're going with yes get the vaccine so if you all think if everybody gets vaccinated it would help us so i think the, the public health measures and vaccination are the top two certainly mm -hmm. this if our goal is not to get more staff to manage more sick people we want to get you not in hospital we don't want you to come into our district health facilities and occupy, need to occupy a hospital bed and go into icu and then potentially mortality and, and and so on so public health measures and vaccination are the top two that we definitely would choose and uh, you have two hands so we go with both swords and right. they're equally important and uh, some persons earlier would have called us a soap and water virus, right. meaning that if you do appropriate sanitization and, and, and maintain distancing and so on, then we could, at that level, primary prevention, mm -hmm. all is better than cure. So we want to thank you all very much. And we drive in home the point again. You heard it from Dr. Maharaj. You heard it from Dr. Ramdani. We need you all to get vaccinated. Vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. And I can't say it. I can't stress it enough because I know some people out there are still a bit skeptical, but we are here. We, are sh we, we have shown through their um, experiences that if you even get your first shot, it's going to reduce the likelihood of you having to be hospitalized even if you contract the virus. So we want you all to please vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. One more time, we let you all know it. Uh, we want to say a special thanks to the PED Cares Foundation for supporting the children. So you all keep on supporting them. Head across to the PED Cares Foundation website and to the PED Cares Foundation's GoFundMe page. Yes, you see the fancy cups here. Mm -hmm. And send those donations so that we can support the PED Cares Foundation so that they can support the children of the nation. As you know, they partner with the schools. They partner with different organizations locally and internationally to give that support and that care. My name is Rome. Thank you all very much for joining us for another episode of Homefront Unplugged.